Now, uh, I'll just say, I mean, no, by no means making light of the situation that we're in, but we've always got to look at the positives, don't we? Uh, and for, so, for example, a couple of weeks ago, I was in WA on my, what was, didn't know at the time, but was my last trip to WA for a while. Uh, and I managed to get a lobster for $30 in a restaurant. So I call that a coronavirus positive. One other coronavirus positive that you're going to get is that for people that don't normally get to see Paul present, uh, you're going to get to see him present uh, and he's going to be on video for you. So uh, as you know, if you get along to our Brisbane or Gold Coast breakfast, you get to see Paul. People in the other states don't tend to. Um, so this is another coronavirus positive seeing Paul. But Paul works in our uh, Brisbane office. Uh, he looks after clients in Queensland and northern New South Wales um, and then Sydney. Um, and he's going to tell us all about asset protection for individuals. Now, clearly, asset protection is a concern at the moment for a lot of people. And uh, to be honest, a lot of the queries that we're getting from clients uh, are in relation to asset protection issues. Um, so Paul is going to talk through some strategies. He's going to talk about what is at risk and what is it not. Uh, and in terms of that presentation, I should have mentioned uh, that at the end of the session, uh, you'll be getting an email with a feedback survey that will also have the slides attached to it. Um, so you'll be able to download the slides uh, as well at a later time. All right, without uh, anything further, I am going to hand over to Paul and turn off my camera and microphone and uh, he will start the presentation. Thank you, Adrian. And thanks everyone for attending. Uh, this is uh, a, a new format for, certainly for me, uh, it's an interesting uh, format, uh, sitting in a room by myself talking to a computer screen. Uh, I hope you get something from it. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is obviously asset protection for individuals. Uh, this is a paper I gave uh, at a breakfast session, um, at our last breakfast session uh, in uh, Brisbane and the Gold Coast. Uh, and if you got along to the Sydney and Perth uh, breakfast sessions um, a few weeks ago, uh, you would have uh, seen this paper as well. Um, but given all that's going on in the world currently, it's, uh, it's obviously a, a timely, uh, or a, a relevant paper uh, to be given. So what we're going to talk about today, uh, the threats that we would ordinarily um, be trying to protect against. Uh, we're going to talk about the nature of asset protection and, and the nature of trusts because we use trusts as a mechanism to give us asset protection as individuals. We're going to look at a scenario um, called Bob the Builder and it is in relation to a client. His name's not Bob, but he is a builder. Um, and we're going to look at uh, some asset protection uh, risks that he had in his business um, well before uh, anything that's currently going on um, and ways we helped him uh, to protect against those risks. And we're going to talk about our secure debt process uh, and what that mechanism entails uh, and how we can use that secure debt process um, to provide some relief uh, to Bob in his scenario. We're going to talk about some alternative approaches uh, that that are out there that um, people often uh, mention to us as well, can't I just do this um, and see whether we can get the same results. Uh, so the threat, uh, when we're talking about asset protection, the, the ultimate threat is a trustee in bankruptcy. So if a client has to go into bankruptcy or is forced into bankruptcy, uh, the question they want answered uh, is, are my assets protected against that? Uh, and obviously, we're talking about individuals today. In our next in our next webinar session, we're going to talk about asset protection uh, for entities, so you know, trusts and companies. Uh, but today, it's about the trustee in bankruptcy as a primary threat. Uh, the second threat that people often come to us and ask questions about is the family court. Um, often, the, the question is, um, I'm hit a rough patch in my marriage or, or relationship, uh, what can I do to protect my assets against that? Or it may be that clients are in a new relationship and, they, and they've been through a messy divorce or separation and they want to make sure that their assets are protected in the future. And general claims. So the threats are that a creditor sues. Uh, well, what are the... Uh, would, would the asset protection uh, mechanisms we have in place protect us in any way against those claims or, or even provide a deterrent uh, for a creditor making a claim? Uh, 
against us. So obviously proper structuring uh, gives us asset protection. Um, so if we were to start with a client from fresh who hadn't built uh, any business, hadn't built up any asset pool, well, proper structuring uh, would be would be more simple uh, than a client who comes to us uh, who already has a structure in place, whether it be that they own everything in their own name uh, or um, they might have a company uh, with some assets and some assets in their own name. But obviously proper structuring is really important. Um, first, we need to look at, well, what are we protecting? What are the assets uh, we have and uh, where are they owned? Who owns them? Uh, and where are the risks or the attacks going to come from? And what we look to do for clients, uh, for, well, for all clients, frankly, is try to separate the value in our assets uh, or the assets from an attack. Uh, and we look to take a priority position uh, through security uh, so that even if an attack comes, uh, a related entity to us has that priority position above other creditors. So when we look at asset protection, our focus is on enforceability. Um, asset protection to a large degree is like insurance. Uh, it's insurance uh, for that day that we enter into bankruptcy or liquidation. Uh, and it's an insurance policy that protects our assets even if, if that occurs. So we need to focus on, well, how do I make these asset protection mechanisms we put in place enforceable. Um, and to do that, we assume the worst case scenario. So the worst case scenario for most people is going into bankruptcy. To bankruptcy. Um, so we look at um, what, are the, what are the strengths and weaknesses of, uh, of our uh, circumstances if we were to go into bankruptcy and we assess those and try to plug try to any holes as we can. That kind of leads into this slide, which has the uh, HMAS asset. Uh, we use this slide uh, for a number of reasons. One, because it's a great metaphor for asset protection. Uh, but two, because our managing principal, Bret Hart, uh, is formerly uh, of the Navy. Um, he loves this slide, um, but it, like I said, it is a, it is a good metaphor uh, for asset protection. Uh, I'm, I'm reliably informed that uh, in, in a scenario where a battleship is out at sea in, in obviously the hostile waters, uh, the way they're designed is they're compartmentalised. So if, if the ship takes a hit uh, to a part of the ship, they can lock down that compartment and uh, essentially um, keep, the, keep the ship moving forward and, and able to you know, move and fire, as, as Brett would say. Um, so we look at asset protection in the same way that we try to compartmentalise or separate um, the different types of assets that make up uh, our structure. Um, so in this case, we're looking at, well, our business assets, our, our business itself, uh, any other types of investments we might have, investment property or share portfolio, uh, our home our principal uh, place of residence and our superannuation. And we, we try to compartmentalise those so that if we if we took a hit uh, to our business, for example, uh, which at the moment is, is uh, on everyone's mind, well, will my business assets that, that form part of the, the running of that business, would they be protected? Uh, and in most cases that, that we see, well, the answer is generally no. Um, because the business assets are generally owned in the same structure as the business. Therefore, an attack on the business would be attack on all of the assets as well. Um, in the case where a client would own, um, for example, all of their assets in their own name, um, so an investment property, their business assets, and, they, and, and their business name are a sole trader, uh, and obviously their home, all of those assets are at risk if, if there were to be an attack in one area, uh, whether it be an investment failure, um, a business uh, failure, uh, well, in that case, all of the compartments are at risk and would likely send that ship uh, to the bottom of the ocean. So we look at, well, are there ways that we can separate uh, our risk uh, from our assets? Um, 
obviously an ideal structure is one where we set this up from the start where each has their own compartment um, each type of asset is owned by a separate discretionary trust for example um, but that isn't always possible uh, clients develop their business structures as, as they go along or their um, their home their home uh, asset base um, and suddenly they get themselves in a position where everything is owned in the one entity. So the principal things that clients come to us for uh, is the family home. Um, most clients who walk through the door might run a business where they are exposed to guarantees for leases, for example, um, and it may be that they, they are simply concerned about um, the family home. Uh, is that going to be safe if, if uh, they uh, get into trouble. Uh, other things that might be at risk are investment properties, for example, um, shares or units, uh, both public and private. Uh, and one often forgotten about uh, asset is a beneficiary account or a UPE uh, in a discretionary trust. The business might be run through a discretionary trust and they, they feel that um, you know, they've got protection as a result of that. Um, but they forget about uh, those little UPEs that build up over time. And if the individual enters bankruptcy, uh, then those UPEs would be called for by a, uh, by a uh, trustee in bankruptcy. So they're the things that you know we would conduct a risk assessment on, a, on an individual who comes to see us and, and look at, well, what are the things that are at risk and, and where are those, um, you know, where are the attacks going to come against? So we're going to delve a little bit into what is a trust because we uh, utilise trusts as a, uh, in a way of um, providing asset protection uh, to both individuals and companies uh, and other trusts for, for that matter. Um, so it's important to have a general understanding of what is a trust and why it gives us asset protection. Now, uh, most people on this webinar today will be accountants or certainly uh, maybe financial planners, but certainly in that, that world where we deal with trusts from uh, fairly regularly. And we talk about them in the same way we talk about companies and individuals. We talk about them as if they're, they're an entity uh, or a separate legal uh, person. Um, and unfortunately, that just isn't the case, even though we as you know, trust lawyers, we still talk about, you know, the trust this and the trust that, um, but really, it is the trustee who bears the who bears that that responsibility. A trust is actually a fiduciary relationship between the trustee, the trust beneficiaries, and the assets of the trust. Um, and fiduciary relationship is is one of those um, legalistic terms that means very little to uh, most people and probably uh, very little to some lawyers. Um, but realistically, uh, it, it, it requires a little bit of um, delving into. It, it, it doesn't have a, a strict definition. Um, it's the kind of thing, thing that a lawyer, when they see it, they'll recognise it, uh, rather than being able to clearly define this is what a fiduciary relationship is. Uh, but if you think about it, um, as I said um, earlier, where uh, you, a person might be entrusted uh, to do something for the benefit of another. Uh, that will be a fiduciary relationship. So in this case, um, uh, a trustee will hold trust property, um, and that may be the $10 settlement sum that they initially get or other assets they acquire, but they hold those assets for the benefit of the beneficiaries. And they have an obligation not to cause de detriment to those to those people. So then that leads us to discretionary beneficiaries. Um, we would use discretionary trusts or a bloodline trust uh, in, in our asset protection work. Uh, and uh, I'll try to come back to the difference between the two um, in a second. Uh, but what are the rights? of discretionary beneficiaries um, to, um, I guess, yeah, what are their rights under that trust? And this is where it becomes particularly uh, useful for asset protection purposes in that the trust, the trust beneficiaries have what is known as a right to be considered uh, under the trust. And all that really means is they have a right 
to ensure that the trustee is adhering to the terms of the trust and and generally under a discretionary trust that means that every year at 30 june they consider which beneficiaries they might distribute income to or perhaps at the end of the life of a trust who they might distribute capital to um, but no more they don't have any rights to the asset so therefore if a trustee in bankruptcy were to um, you know were to step in and say well uh, this bankrupt is a beneficiary and therefore we want access to the assets of this trust well in the ordinary sense without leaving UPEs aside um, in, a, in a discretionary trust well, they have no right to do that because all all they have as, as standing in the shoes of that beneficiary is a right to ensure that the trustee follows the trustee and considers the trust beneficiary for distribution. It's always to be read in context of what the trust deed says. So you hear the mantra of read the deed, um, you know, in, in trust circles, um, but it is really important to understand, well, what does each deed uh, say and what does that mean for those beneficiaries? Um, it's probably one of the most um, misunderstood aspects of trust and it certainly took me a while when I was a new lawyer to understand that no two trust deeds are the same and outside of certain rules um, a trust deed can pretty much say what you want whatever you want it to say um, there's no one set of rules that you can go to a piece of legislation and say well they're the rules that, that all trusts follow so it's, it's really important that we understand the particular terms of every trust deed we encounter hi paul um, before you move on to the next slide, we've got a question uh, as, and I'll just read out the question when you're ready. Yep. As tax agents, are there any issues with us being the settler of a trust or should we make the client the settler? Well, I'll, I'll answer the second part first. No, you shouldn't make the client the settler. Um, the reason being is that uh, for tax purposes, the settler of the trust should not be a beneficiary of the trust. And most trustees will, will exclude the settler of the trust uh, as a beneficiary. And that's why often um, the accountant or tax agent uh, or the lawyer who, who establishes it, I, I settle deeds every day of the week. Um, that's why we take that role because we're not ever going to benefit. Um, and the reason is that uh, if, if the set law has the ability to benefit under the trust, uh, there's a section in the 1936 Act which, which says, uh, in short, that the trust may be taxed at the top marginal rate um, because it's uh, what's considered a revocable trust. So to answer the second question first, um, no, your client, if they're going to be the beneficiary, they should certainly not uh, be the set law. Uh, as to whether you, the tax agent, should be, um, I don't think there's any rules that would prohibit under the, the tax agent, um, you know, um, professional guidelines. The only distinction I would, or the only point of difference I would make is that I've seen plenty of deeds um, set up um, incorrectly uh, when someone, not suggesting tax agents, but it has, has been from time to time, set it up using just an online portal, um, don't totally understand or make mistakes. Um, again, that just brings a little bit of liability home for you, but um, in, in terms of uh, whether you should or shouldn't, um, I, I don't think there's any any reason why you couldn't uh, be that, uh, that certain. Okay. Just, um, yeah. All right, Paul, well, just, uh, just had a request. Um, can Hi and Peter Dunn please turn off their microphones? Uh, one of you are, is tapping on a keyboard uh, and some of the other people can hear you. If you missed it before, um, if you hover over somebody's tile and they have their audio on, you can mute them at your end um, and that just affects them. But if yeah, Hi and Peter, if you could turn off your microphones, please. Um, coming back to that question from Mark, the only time I've ever seen uh, that become an issue uh, where the tax agent was the set law um, was uh, it was an accountant uh, in Queensland, uh, long-standing client, and he'd been the settler for uh, pretty much all of this client's trust deeds. Uh, he ended up marrying the client's daughter, uh, 
which meant under the terms of the trust, he couldn't receive any benefit from those trusts. Um, fantastic for the client from an asset protection perspective, because if the accountant split from the daughter, then we don't have any family law issues because uh, he was excluded as being the set law. Um, but the accountant was trying to work out ways that he could still get access to the funds from the trust. Um, that's just a, a bit of a war story there. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, and do keep the questions coming through. If you do have other questions, um, more than happy to, uh, to get into those. Uh, so coming back to discretionary trusts, um, we say that um, the trust should be should have fully discretionary trusts, and the distinction there is uh, that we mean that there are no uh, default beneficiaries uh, within the trustee. So a default beneficiary is where uh, the, if the trustee fails to make a distribution of income, for example, then the income would be automatically distributed to a particular um, default beneficiary. Uh, we say the asset protection benefits of not having a default beneficiary outweigh the tax uh, consequence of um, an accumulation, for example. Um, and we, yeah, that's the view we take that asset protection is, is uh, preferential. Uh, in, in practice, we don't really see too many trustees failing uh, to make their distributions at the right time. Um, obviously, it is, it is a risk, but um, we take the view that it's better to not have default beneficiaries. So in that case, um, as I said, a trustee in bankruptcy who steps into a beneficiary's shoes uh, could, only, could only ask a trustee, uh, a trustee of a trust that is, uh, for an asset or for income if, if there was a fixed right under that trust. If it's purely uh, they have a, an expectancy as a discretionary beneficiary, uh, then those assets in that trust would be protected against uh, that trustee in bankruptcy. So obviously some planning consequences of using a fully discretionary trust um, are, are, I would hope, fairly obvious. Um, we say that only fully discretionary trusts, again, with no default beneficiaries, can deliver true asset protection. Um, if we're establishing companies or unit trusts, uh, we need to make sure that those entities are owned by fully discretionary trusts. Um, if the desire is obviously asset protection, there may be other reasons uh, why you put an individual as a, as a shareholder, for example, but uh, if asset protection uh, is uh, critical, then we, we need to make sure that we're using fully discretionary trusts. Now I'll slip in here um, my comment about the difference between a discretionary trust and a bloodline trust. Uh, so we uh, we developed our bloodline trust uh, in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, and the difference is that the capital of the of the fund, um, that is assets um, in the fund, can only ever be distributed to bloodline beneficiaries. So a beneficiary who fits within a, a particular bloodline, usually based on, for example, mum and dad um, come to see us as a client, they, they want to make sure that their assets are protected against divorce and things like that of their children and future generations. Well, uh, we would recommend a bloodline trust because our capital can never go to anyone who's not a bloodline beneficiary. Uh, however, income, so income generated in the trust, uh, can go to non-bloodline beneficiaries to assist with state, you know, state planning and management of uh, income taxes uh, for a particular family. But again, capital is protected um, within the bloodline. So if we turn to our example of Bob the Builder, as I said, he, this is a legitimate client of mine uh, and he runs a successful uh, building company which had a bit over... Uh, six million dollars in retained earnings um, and had a significant amount of that was actually in cash. Um, he had his home on the Gold Coast waterfront was valued at about two million dollars um, and each of those assets, so the shares in the company uh, and his home were debt free. So obviously looking at that, you know, client walks through the door, the first thing that jumps out is very high risk uh, of asset for asset protection. So what we 
implemented for him, amongst other things, which we uh, will cover in our next session next uh, Thursday on asset protection for entities, is dealing uh, with, uh, I guess, his personal assets. So talking about the uh, debt on his home uh, and also his shares in the company. Um, so in this scenario, we established a bloodline trust, uh, which assisted him with his estate planning goals of making sure that you know the capital that he developed through his lifetime uh, is protected for his family, uh, for mainly his children in the next generation. Uh, so we established that bloodline trust uh, with a corporate trustee, uh, and he quantified uh, his net the net equity in his estate. So uh, on the previous slide, uh, it's the $8 million in, in uh, net, net terms, and he made a gift of uh, that eight million dollars to the trustee of the bloodline trust. And while we recommend a corporate trustee for every uh, every trust um, to assist with you know, asset protection, uh, we absolutely needed it in this case because uh, Bob couldn't be the sole trustee of the trust and enter into a transaction with himself uh, in those two different capacities. So Bob made a gift of uh, $8 million to the Bloodline Trust, and uh, we use a negotiable instrument um, called the Bearer Promissory Note to evidence or make the payment of that, that gift of $8 million. And the Bloodline Trust then lent that money back to him uh, and took security over his house and over the shares uh, in the company. So in this case, uh, we look at the next slide, which talks about the outcome. So originally, the shares in the company were worth $6 million. Well, they, they stayed at $6 million. Um, they're still valued at that amount. Uh, but where we had zero debt originally, we now have $6 million worth of debt attached to those shares. Same for the home. The home is still worth $2 million. It's still owned in Bob's name, as are the shares, uh, which is a common... Uh, common misunderstanding people have, well, the assets stay where they are, they don't transfer title, um, but we're shifting the value of those uh, to the trust. So we had no debt before, but now we have $2 million worth of debt um, associated with the house. So if we look at uh, the trustee's assets, well, the trustee formerly had very little assets, had $10 settlement sum. Um, but now it has uh, an asset being the loan to Bob uh, worth $8 million. And that has no debt attached to it uh, because it was a gift, it wasn't a loan. Um, and you can see by implementing that structure, uh, we have shifted the value being that $8 million to the trustee of the trust. Uh, and we've secured the debt owed uh, by Bob uh, in favor of the trustee. Now, you might say, uh, well, uh, why didn't we just transfer the shares or the, or the house? Um, the obvious answer, which I'm sure you uh, have seen, is, well, there's going to be a lot, lot of taxes payable on those. So obviously some CGT, it was a shelf company when he started it, um, and um, the house on the waterfront would have uh, no CGT because obviously it's our main residence, but we would have stamp duty, which would be significant. Um, so, sorry to interrupt. We've got some questions. I'll break it into three. Sure. Um, so, first one. Uh, so, no ownership, CGT, or duties issues. Yeah, no. All we are doing is transferring money, in a sense. Um, so, there are no uh, CGT or stamp duty issues in relation to the transfer of that money. Okay. And uh, does it affect access to small business CGT concessions? Uh, no, it won't. Um, obviously, the assets of that trust would be related and therefore um, a part to it. Um, so, in effect, you're just moving the value which would have been in Bob's name to a different entity which would be related. Um, so, it doesn't necessarily change uh, that calculation. Bob wasn't entitled to that small business. Obviously, if the figures are less, well, maybe he would have been. Um, if the figures were less, we, we might have looked at a different way of dealing with the shares. Um, but no, it doesn't really change that position. 
Okay, and we had another one come in, so now we're at four, we're up to the third. Um, practically, what does Bob have to do going forward? Does he always have to keep adding assets? So uh, if the shares in the company continue to go up, or the, probably more relevantly the house, um, then what we need to do is collect that, that increase in the equity and shift that value over to the trust. Uh, if, for example, Bob were to sell his house, um, Bob would sell his house, uh, the $2 million debt could be paid back to the trust. And from there, we could then implement a better strategy for, um, you know, for Bob buying the next house. We could, we could buy it either in that bloodline trust or another uh, bloodline trust. Um, and that way, Bob would get the associated asset protection that he's after um, from doing this, this uh, process. Uh, but yes, you do need to keep uh, monitoring those increases in equity. So if we if we um, valued it today, it's eight million. If if in three years it's eight point five, well, we need to think whether we're going to make a further gift of five hundred thousand dollars. And we re we regularly follow up every three years uh, with our clients who've done this to to just to remind them to keep on top of those things. Okay, before I ask the the last bit of the question, um, Ian, I notice you've just joined us. Uh, welcome to the webinar. And we'd just ask you to turn off your camera and mic microphone, please. If you look at the bottom of your screen, there should be uh, an icon at the bottom where you can click both camera and microphone. Um, that's just to avoid background noise. Uh, and if you have your camera on, uh, other attendees can see what you're doing. Um, with uh, last question, Paul, uh, in terms of uh, adding or buying additional investment property, for example, would you put that in the trust or would you put that elsewhere? Um, look, it, elsewhere is probably ideal in, a, in another type of trust, uh, whether it be a discretionary trust or bloodline trust. Um, but as I, as I said in that scenario, um, if the funding is coming, from, for example, from the sale of one house, um, then you could effectively pay back that loan you could have this secured debt trust as a bank, in effect, uh, to lend to that other trust and take security again so that even though you might be protecting against, um, you know, Bob's business creditors, you've still got creditors who may come forward in relation to um, that, that investment property. So what you don't want, uh, I'm sorry, I'll finish that thought. What you don't want is you don't want... Um, this secured debt trust to be owed six million dollars to to then or, um, eight million dollars sorry to then go and buy an asset in that trust which then fails and uh, then the debt that's owed by Bob could get called in um, so having it in a separate trust is is ideal. Thanks, Paul. That's all the questions uh, before you move on. Of course. No matter where you're buying it, obviously you need to think about other issues such as land tax and tax concessions and those sorts of things. So um, usually, as usual, there's no one answer for that sort of query. It's going to be on a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah, and, and oftentimes it's, it's uh, about a choice between, um, you know, there's no one perfect solution that gets you the best of everything. It's about a trade-off between what, what might be good on the one hand and, and you know, and have downsides on the other. Um, and it's about really weighing up each individual purchase, particularly of significant assets as to where, where it is and, um, and where you might purchase them in the next uh, iteration. Uh, so coming back to our, uh, I guess our, our diagram, uh, the, the final step in that loan is taking security and security is the vital um, cog in this wheel, albeit that they're all in, all the steps are important and getting them right is important, uh, but security is vital in order to protect the interests of the trustee over um, other, other secured and unsecured creditors. Um, so in any fight between creditors, if um, secured creditors get paid in order of their security and unsecured creditors get paid if, if there's anything left um, and, and equally amongst them. Uh, when we're talking about asset protection and giving away uh, our net equity, uh, we have to talk about the Bankruptcy Act uh, for individuals. And there are clawback periods um, whereby transactions can be made void 
Um, and the predominant one here is section 120 of the Bankruptcy Act, uh, which is about undervalued transactions. So if, if the transaction is a gift, it's going to be for undervalue. We're not, we're not receiving in, uh, anything in return for our gift of $8 million, so therefore it's undervalued. Um, if the trustee can prove that the client, Bob, uh, was solvent at the time of the gift, then that clawback period will be four years. If they can't prove it, uh, then it extends for a year out to five years. Obviously, if this is a transfer to defeat a creditor, um, then there is no time limit. If, if the client knows they're being sued or they're very likely to be sued tomorrow, um, then this transfer, if it is to defeat that creditor, uh, there is no time limit and a trustee can seek to set aside or have void um, that transaction. Uh, if it were a preference payment, so um, for example, we might have uh, our trustee or, or a related entity uh, might be, be a creditor of Bob. Uh, well, if, if, a, if that creditor is paid in preference to another creditor uh, within six months of uh, the act of bankruptcy, uh, then that can be unwound as well. It's, that's probably less likely in this scenario. Uh, the first bullet point there is, uh, is the most relevant. Uh, so this slide kind of tells you um, where we start from. If you start from uh, the right side of the screen at the act of bankruptcy. So that is the, the first act of bankruptcy um, within the six months before a creditor lodges their petition for bankruptcy. So uh, if we make a gift today, uh, uh, sorry, not today, close to today, on the 1st of May this year, um, then we have to get outside that four year period being to the 2nd of May, 2024, before um, we not necessarily commit an act of bankruptcy, uh, we might commit one along the way, but the, the act of bankruptcy is an official term under the Bankruptcy Act. So before that official act of bankruptcy is enacted. Uh, provided we're solvent at the date of our gift, and we usually get our clients to speak to their accounts about um, providing some sort of evidence or statement as to their solvency at the date of the gift provided they're insolvent, that four years uh, is the general rule. Uh, there are some other pieces of legislation that have similar effects to the Bankruptcy Act. Sorry, Sorry. Paul. Yep. Uh, just before you move on, just a couple of questions that have come in. Uh, first one I'll answer. Um, so you could make the bloodline trust the bank and everything work through there. Uh, that, that's right. And that's often a way I describe it to clients when I'm talking to the, them about this sort of strategy, that this trust is their bank. Uh, and it, in the end, it, hopefully it has security over all of their assets. And like any other bank, it's not going to let go of that security unless it gets paid. So that's yeah, a good way to describe it to clients. Second question I'll send back to Paul. Uh, would you use different corporate trustees for multiple trusts or can you use the same? Uh, the answer is you, you can use the same, should you? No, um, for a number of reasons. Uh, one, uh, one reason is a, is a land tax issue in Queensland. Um, I'm not 100% certain about other states, but I assume they're the same. Um, if, if you have uh, the same trustee on title, you will more than likely get one land tax threshold in Queensland, although New South Wales don't have a land tax threshold for trust, so that's probably irrelevant. Um, but in Queensland, from a land tax perspective, um, no. The reason I probably say you shouldn't is um, because it muddies the waters. Um, if, if you have an asset owned uh, by one corporate trustee uh, for two trusts, uh, it, it can get muddy when uh, the trustee as trustee for one trust is being sued uh, and the creditor is saying, well, those assets over there should be a part of, you know, your property. Um, and it gets a bit messy where um, you are saying, you're trying to have an argument saying, well, the corporate trustee owns those assets for another trust. Um, yeah. Whereas if you had a separate trustee um, owning whatever it might be, it's a, it's a lot easier to prove that those assets are not part of that lawsuit. There's probably a number of other reasons that, that aren't springing to mind, but the answer is, is I, I regularly tell people um, 
it is if asset protection is what you're after, don't skimp on the six hundred bucks to get a company and two hundred and fifty to to pay the fees every year, because uh, you will spend fifty times that or hundred times that in court trying to trying to untangle that mess. Um, so. I'll keep moving. Um, there are some other pieces of legislation around the country that have similar effects to the Bankruptcy Act. Uh, New South Wales has uh, what I call the notional estate provisions in their Succession Act, um, which allow tr trust assets to be included in, in that notional estate of the deceased, uh, or assets that might have been transferred away from the estate uh, to be also included in the notional estate of the deceased. So we have to take a little bit of extra care in how we structure the trusts in New South Wales, as well as um, understanding that there's a, an extra callback period if it's in relation to a succession matter. So one of the questions we often get, uh, probably more than you uh, would like to know, is um, yeah, a client ring will ring the office and say, I'm um, I'm about to be uh, separated from my spouse. Uh, what can I do to protect my assets? Um, um, the answer is generally, well, it is not much. Um, there's very little you can do, and even if you try to do it, uh, what you're more than likely doing is poking an eye, uh, poking a finger in the eye of the family court, uh, and it will likely be unwound. That's not to say that uh, there may not be genuine reasons to uh, to look at protections against the family court uh, if you're not in that scenario. So you, it may be that parents are concerned about their children's spouses. Um, that's very, very often a concern for, for parents uh, who come to see us. Um, so they wanna look at strategies to look at uh, how to protect their assets from a spouse that, of their child that might uh, separate from them, uh, or they might have been through uh, a divorce themselves and they want to look after their children uh, and they want to protect those assets uh, from a future relationship they might enter into. So there's certainly strategies that can be put in place. What we need to look at is genuine control of, of the secured debt trust uh, or the bank trust in this case. Um, we need to make sure that that control is uh, not with the one person who might be subject to a family court order, because what the family court has said is, well, if that trust is the alter ego of the divorcing party, then the court will include those assets of the trust as, as part of the pool to be divided up. But if there is a genuine lack of control by that person, and that may be shared control or it may be total control in someone else, uh, and it's genuine, um, then those assets can be protected from a family court order. Uh, it is about evidence. So I can tell you what the law is and I can tell you about all the cases um, that have involved similar things. And all of the cases that have been successful have, have had at their core uh, genuine control by someone else uh, or shared control by someone else. Um, where the, where the cases, and they probably don't make it to court, where the cases lose is where uh, the, I'll take the husband, for example, has a trust in which uh, his father is the trustee and appointer or principal, um, but dad just does whatever the son says. Um, if that's the case, those cases generally lose or, or end up in settlements. Um, so it is more about um, genuine control aspects than the principle of law. So we'll take a couple of uh, alternative approaches that are out there and, and see whether they get the same results. Um, short answer is uh, they don't. Some of these until recent times I thought weren't bad strategies, but uh, you know, if, if that's all the client was willing to do, um, you know, I thought, well, they're not terrible strategies. I, I've kind of changed my view in light of uh, some personal experiences um, helping clients uh, recently. Um, so the first one is, um, you know, we're worried about Bobco having significant uh, retained earnings uh, and, uh, you know, why can't we just implement a, a rollover to interpose a company um, and pay a dividend between those companies and then that 
that protects Bob Code. Um, well, for, for me, this was put out there as a strategy to protect Bob, and it doesn't do anything of the sort. Um, yes, it protects Bob Co to some degree, um, but I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, but it doesn't really help Bob at all. He's still worth um, he's that, he shares in that comp in holding Co are uh, still worth six million dollars. It's just that the retained earnings have moved uh, location. Uh, coming back to uh, whether that really even provides asset protection for Bob Co um, is doubtful. Uh, there is a section in the Corporations Act which says that if you're in a holding company scenario like this, uh, effectively there are certain conditions where holding co will be liable for the debts of Bob Co. Um, so it doesn't, it, it's not going to provide uh, asset protection for Bob and not necessarily provide any uh, for Bob Co. The second scenario is, well, I'll put everything in Wendy's name. Um, so in our case, we'll, we've moved the house into Bob's name. He's willing to pay, uh, sorry, into Wendy's name. Uh, he's willing to pay the stamp duty or maybe they bought the house in Wendy's name. Uh, but Wendy doesn't earn an income uh, from the business, doesn't or earns um, very little income. Uh, Bob is subsequently made bankrupt uh, and that trustee in bankruptcy claims an equitable interest in the home. Uh, because all the payments have come from Bob. Bob has made all the repayments on the home loan. He paid off the principal in record time because he's got a good business. Uh, now he's trusting in bankruptcy is saying, well, that house we, we wanted, or at least a significant portion of it. Now, for a long time, I thought this was a sensible solution. Um, and until, you know, until very recently where I had a client go through this exact scenario, um, I, I've changed my tune. So um, it, it doesn't provide all the asset protection that is needed. Yes, it gets the, the house out of Bob's name, but trustee and bankruptcies are now going after those assets. So the final one is uh, from a, a case recently, um, and it's, you know, but I'll just make Wendy the director of the company. And then that way, Bob, who owns the house, is, is safe. Uh, leaving aside the issue on the, on the previous slide about a trustee and bankruptcy claiming an interest in the property anyway, um, it may be the case that um, in this scenario, Wendy's not involved in the business. Um, Bob runs the business. He's the, he's the, he might be called, you know, CEO or something similar, but um, he's not a director. Um, but Bob signs all the contracts uh, for the company. Uh, the business traded whilst insolvent uh, and the liquidator went to court and, and wanted to declare Bob a shadow director because he did all of all of the actions a normal director would do. Uh, as I said, this is the facts of a case uh, recently from the Queensland Supreme Court. And in that case, Bob was declared, uh, wasn't Bob, but in that case, the shadow director was declared a shadow director uh, and was uh, liable uh, for debts um, in the same way a director would be. So in that case, Bob being the homeowner, uh, if he went into bankruptcy, well, that home would be at risk in that scenario. So what might have been considered a good strategy by Bob um, didn't really help. So kind of as a recap, what we've tried to do, we haven't been able to get to the position where our home is separated from our investments, business assets and business. Um, and we haven't been able to do that because we didn't want the large uh, tax taxes and stamp duty that come along with moving the assets into those separate compartments. But what we've been able to do is to, in effect, uh, raise the, the debt from being zero uh, to, to a position where all of our, um, all of our assets are indebted um, and they're indebted to an entity that is in its own separate compartment and is protected from that uh, downside risk uh, to the to the uh, both business assets and uh, and business risk. So we have separated the risk uh, from where we store the assets. Obviously it is just the value of the assets, it's not the assets themselves, um, but uh, that is the best we could get under this scenario. So what we would do uh, both at the beginning or if a client came to us and said, oh, you know, we did this asset protection work a number of years ago, um, now we're under attack by creditors, um, which unfortunately will be very relevant at the moment. Uh, we'd look at, well, what, com 
what compartments or entities are compromised by, by what's happening. We'd identify the safe assets, the exposed assets, and our secured creditors. And we'd ensure uh, that we'd look at, well, is it watertight, meaning have we protected every ounce of equity we have in our estate, or are there portions that are um, in, you know, uh, left unsecured? And are there ways to shore up our position? So um, even if they might not be under attack, if we're, if we're looking at a review, um, has the equity increased and can we protect that equity further? So again, we'd look at uh, clawback periods and whether we're outside or inside, if we're defending against a, a creditor. Uh, we'd consider control of uh, trusts that are in the group um, and we'd check on fault beneficiaries and we'd make sure we understood the deed completely. Uh, and we re restrict the flow of information. So who has a right to access certain information about our structures. And uh, if they have a right, fine, we'll give them the information at, a, at the appropriate time. If they don't have the right, then we resist that, uh, that information gathering exercise for them. So as a summary, uh, what we've tried to do today is show a way that uh, our secure debt process can help separate uh, the risk or the, the value certainly from our assets, uh, ways that we would look at pressure testing all our structures uh, by looking at you know, the net equity figures and determining who our secured and unsecured creditors are. But timing is everything. Um, and we need to make sure, particularly in the context of our clawback periods, that, that we act before um, you know, it's too late. Unfortunately, for a lot of people at the moment, who may be facing, uh, you know, uh, bankruptcies uh, in in these uncertain times? Um, they may not have these structures in place, um, but it's important that you know we all understand that um, you know, timing is important because those clawback periods uh, are hard coded into the legislation, uh, and if we can put in place asset protection measures measures now, we should be doing so. So that's uh, my paper for today. I've literally hit the time on the dot. Um, so thank you for your um, questions, certainly. If you have any more, I'd be happy to take them up now. Thanks, Paul. Um, while we give everyone an opportunity to perhaps type in some questions, I'll just run through just you know, a couple of things in terms of admin. Uh, I mentioned uh, you'll be receiving an email at the end of this presentation, which will uh, include a feedback survey. Only short questions. We, of course, take all feedback on board, so we'd love to for you to complete it. Uh, and together with that email will also be the slides from today, so you can download the slides if you wish. Invitations and details for the next webinar will go out on Monday, which, uh, and the web, as I mentioned at the start, the webinar will be held on Thursday um, due to Good Friday. Uh, but after that, we're going to be running, unless there's other public holidays, we'll be running on Fridays. Uh, and trying to run two sessions in the day. Continuing on from the asset protection, it'll be all about asset protection of entities next week. Uh, and then we'll continue on with a few other asset protection presentations after that. These webinars are recorded. So hopefully we'll be releasing those recordings uh, as we go through them. Uh, if you haven't already, um, we have our, traditionally our all day face-to-face -face workshop in May uh, in pretty much all of the states, um, which uh, we've moved to a, to a four hour live video presentation. It'll be a different format in terms of the software. Um, but um, if you haven't already registered, keep an eye out for those emails in terms of registrations for those. Or if you're not getting them, let me know and I can organize for you to get them. Um, I'd like to say thank you for coming along today. Uh, if you want to, uh, sorry, um, if you want to hang around and just have a chat, you're more than welcome to um, while you're here. Um, but otherwise, that'll conclude our webinar as there's no other questions. Uh, thanks for coming along. Thanks uh, for being guinea pigs in the sense of our first weekly webinar gone down in history. Um, and uh, we hope to see you soon. Uh, as I said, more than happy if you've got questions that you want to ask. Uh, if you want to stay on the line, you can obviously ask those of Paul or myself. I'm going to turn my mic off so Paul can answer the questions.